I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't know who I am. No matter what happens in life, that the sun will always, you know, rise and, and set the same way. As you can tell, I love using my language. I love seeing how language can really change the world. Build our community, because that's what makes us strong. It's important for you to know that I'm speaking to all of Colorado when I say that now is the time to stay at home. The numbers are telling us and the data is telling us that while we've made progress on increasing social distancing, that progress is not enough. And that's why I'm acting today to issue a stay at home order that begins Thursday, March 26th at six in the morning and lasts until Saturday, April 11th, 2020. didn't ask my husband. <laughs> I kind of uh, signed up and then um, 48 hours later got a, uh, got a phone call saying like, hey, can you be on a plane in 24 hours? And so I kind of turned to him and said, hey, so I know we have a three-year-old and a five-year-old and I know there's like this massive global pandemic happening and I want to go to the epicenter. Is that okay? And oh, by the way, I'm leaving in 24 hours. <laughs> I can honestly say this is the least crowded I've ever seen, Denver International Airport. Hi, Camille Sasson. I'm an ER doctor. I have been practicing now for 18 plus years. Um, work here at, throughout the Denver metro area. You know, I think within just a few weeks, uh, the numbers started to spike in New York City. It was clear to me that I needed to be out there to help. I wanted to know what this new disease was, right? So the part of this is, you know, it's a completely brand new virus no one's ever heard of. So I wanted to be on the scene right where everything kind of started in the epicenter. And so I needed to go out there because really everything in Colorado had shut down and we didn't have cases yet. I'm just a little overwhelmed thinking that I had no idea what to walk into in the next um, few hours, but here we go. It's probably the most surreal experience ever because I landed, you know, in New York City at the airport and there was literally not a soul. And so I spent a, a whole month out there working at a field hospital. So it's the first time in my career where I couldn't go back to a, a book, right, and say like, oh, what is this? Like, how do we treat this? How does, you know, what's the disease course? Like, we were literally living history. I love you. Have a nice day. Hug. <laughs> the hardest part for me was, you know, watching my husband at home <laughs> with my two kids, right, three and five years old, and, you know, it's hard to leave your family for that long. You do it because you know you have to, and you really want to be there to help other people, but... We love you, we love you, always! I didn't think I was going to get this emotional, sorry. Uh, you know, I think there's also just this, there's so much fear and anxiety, and, you know, we were, there's the fear, like, hey, look, I'm going to go to the epicenter of all of this and put my life on the line, but there was, more, there was more fear for me being at home and bringing it home to my family. And so, in some ways, it was actually easier for me to leave and to leave them for a month and then to leave them actually for the next almost year because you know, I didn't want to get them sick. I see someone who is really dedicated to her work wearing a very intense mask here, and eye protection, and a gown, um, and her white coat's in the background. And so this is not a glamorous picture, this is a picture of someone who's working hard. Um, I also see, you know, a face and have to think about how do I, you know, accurately depict this. I'm a hobby artist, but really what is so striking about this image of, Ab of Abby is um, this intense mask. This is the front line of the COVID response, everyone. First and foremost, I'm a physician and, and a mom and a wife, I guess. You know, I'm still a, a charcoal or pastel and paper person. I'm a full-time infectious disease provider at Denver Public Health. Yeah, I just kind of start sketching it out and making lots of little adjustments as we go. So this is um, Abby Laura, and she is a pulmonologist at CU Denver. So I am on the front lines and um, supporting my colleagues and in my free time, I like to draw and paint. When 
I saw the New Yorker cover with the woman physician in her full PPE and she was just FaceTiming with her husband and kids to say goodnight to them. Um, it just reminded me of my own experience and I felt like that's really cool. They're showing a woman and they're showing a family because, you know, doctors and nurses and, you know, technicians, we all have families. Um, and then there was another really cool cover of a um, black man who was in his scrubs and I just noticed that there weren't that many women of color um, being depicted as healthcare heroes, people who I don't think the society has really recognized and appreciated enough. I was blown away when I was asked to deliver a, a selfie of me working on the front lines with respirators and masks and ways to protect ourselves in times of COVID. And that, that was a specific ask for women physicians and women physicians of color. Called Women of Color on the Front Lines and it's uh, highlighting women uh, physicians, but also we want to move into all healthcare providers um, who are black, indigenous, or women of color, and who are on the front lines of the COVID epidemic um, in healthcare. You know, there are women in medicine, there are people of color in medicine, but to dial down into being a woman physician of color in medicine in these times, that's a very special, uh, place to feel like you fit and to then feel like okay oh great this is someplace I fit I never realized it was a thing and then say and then have someone say oh no this is a thing and we want a selfie of you doing your thing and then to have a turnout like this is pretty amazing. I just like the way it kind of shows that we're helping each other toward a common goal and working as a team and that's really what healthcare is, is you know, it's nothing without teamwork. I came back broken, but being in the ICU and having to call families every day and say, here's your update on your family member, or wow, you know, they're gonna die soon. Do you wanna FaceTime with them? And then I was the person who was relaying their messages to them. You know, if you think about like how awful that is, right? Because some of the deaths that I experienced as one of the doctors, like the last person you see before you pass away, we're just, it's a whole different type of and I think for the family members, I think that's what made it really hard was knowing that they couldn't be there. So I think that was the, that was last of my travel, especially. I don't think I could do that. It's a very different way of having to say goodbye. I hit a point where I think it was the very end of December, I got my first vaccine shot and I felt like everything just changed. And I was like, I can go home. You wanna go look? I will say when I first got my vaccine, um, I cried. <laughs> Shocking, I know. Um, you know, but it was just one of those things where it was just this emotional release, right? Of like, okay, maybe the world will be okay. I'm getting COVID-19. I'm getting Stuffy's COVID-19 shot. My daughter did the cutest thing. She had a vaccine clinic for her stuffies that she would host every few weekends. <laughs> so I have these like amazing little videos of her like lining everybody up on, on our bed. <laughs> and so that's been my coping mechanism is knowing that like through this all, like I have just an amazing group of family and friends that are gonna support me um, even in my darkest times and in my best times. This space is where we enter and exit the building. So this was the stairwell prior um, and the experience of each healthcare worker coming in through um, this parking garage. It's cold, it's dreary, it's kind of a typical cinder block um, stairwell. There have been times when it's been really tough to walk through those doors. Like it really wasn't something that you looked forward to walking through. From the very beginning, from our hearts, we wanted to honor um, the healthcare workers and the individuals here who've worked so hard over this past year keeping us safe and healthy during COVID. So now you walk through those doors, you know, you might be taking some deep breaths as you are about to walk into you don't know what, but you're surrounded by 
you know, somewhat familiar faces. Well, as an artist, I think we're, we're trying to use our medium to, to make a difference to people's lives. I love this mural because I love that all our associates are represented in some form or fashion, male, female, um, volunteers, dietitians, physicians, nurses. Um, it's not just one type of associate. For myself as an artist, I almost wanted to create this as a mirror to reflect the own good, their own goodness and the, the sort of feeling that comes from the bottom of their hearts in terms of why they're doing what they're doing. People are here to truly care and to um, spend their time uplifting others. And so what I wanted to do with the figures was actually reflect back to them the upliftment that they give to others here in the community. My wife came up with the idea with me being a painter and us knowing Carly who's a muralist and, and, and much more. What could we do to inspire and, and say thank you for all this, this hard work that so many different kinds of people that work at the hospital do? I especially love this one at the top of the stairs here, like through adversity we rise. Because it's a space that these doctors pass every single day and the medical staff, we thought that maybe just for a few seconds out of their day, it could brighten and uplift um, mm -hmm. their experience in and out of Joe's. You know, people are trying to give back in a way that's different from just saying, you know, here's some money and you know, we're gonna try and support you, but how can we make a difference in, in their lives? And that's how this mural came about. We all really like the one that says that you can do hard things because I think for all of us, we're challenged in our own ways every day. And it's just a little reminder that um, yes, we can get through hard times and we can do hard things. It's just about putting one foot in front of the other with your heart and with authenticity and you know your dedication. It says you're the one that counts, you know, remember why you're here, um, be kind, be brave, and be the good in the world. Throughout the time that we've been painting, um, we left paint markers here so that people could come and write messages. And I love this one that was in Arabic, which is gorgeous, that says thanks to, um, for St. Joe's Heroes. Um, I also really love that um, there's, you know, words in Spanish and other languages like somos valientes, like we're courageous. And um, the messages here are contributed by the staff. And so I feel like with their input and with their contribution, um, they have a little more ownership in it and a little bit more um, feeling and heart that goes into the process. I need to hear that from the people that I work with. Like I love all the community support that we got and continue to get, but only the people who have worked in the hospital for the last year can really know what you're going through. They're risking their lives, their families, you know, um, and their well-being to keep the rest of us safe. And I don't know if personally I could offer them any better way to thank them other than what truly comes from my heart, which is the artwork. This is going to outlive us. It's going to outlive this pandemic for sure, and it's going to be a permanent installation here for as long as this hospital's around. I'm very much a type A personality and tend to like to be in control and the mountain never lets you be in control. I mean, it's learning how to, you know, take small steps and adapt and overcome an obstacle. As a healthcare worker, you're faced with difficult situations every day. You know, learning to be able to trust yourself, the people around you and break up problems into smaller pieces in order to accomplish them. I mean, that can be applied to not only healthcare, but I mean, life in general. Hold that one time. First Ascent is an organization that provides adventure trips for, originally for young adults with cancer. They've since sort of expanded their mission to include multiple sclerosis as well as healthcare workers and using adventure trips to really help pull people out of their shells and create a community. When COVID came along, it was actually quite an easy pivot to go from serving what we refer to as our oncology folks to serving stressed out healthcare workers. Because the fact is, well, the stuff we do here 
everybody needs it. And so my, my kind of get to know you question tonight is uh, why did you get in a car and come here? I found myself just this spring, uh, we had a, here in Colorado, our, our last like big um, influx of COVID patients was this winter. And I've just found myself being like, I need to, I need to be more spontaneous, like sign up for things and put myself out there. What's the worst that can happen? Nurse camaraderie is definitely like a thing. Like you can talk to anybody, like we've just met today, but we can all tell these stories. It's like, yeah, yeah, you know, it's not a thing. But like sometimes, I don't know if this is everybody else, but like your significant others or your friends or your families, I, surprisingly, I feel like downplay what we go through. Like they know that it's, like in their minds, they know that it's crazy, but they don't know how, in what way it's crazy because they don't see it when you see or encounter people that are like refusing to do these public health things, it's hard to not take it as a personal like slight slight to your experience throughout this. The bonfire was the perfect way to really kick off this experience. We could be vulnerable with one another and we all just had this immediate bond. It was very empowering. As soon as I arrived here, we were given nicknames, which my nickname is Dolly. I go by Bambi here. My name's Dino. Pissa. <laughs> Busted. Skipper. Huckleberry. My name is Rutro. My nickname is McSteamy. The tradition at First Descent says that when campers show up, they shed their baggage, both literally and figuratively, at the door, and they all get assigned a new nickname. I'm a paramedic up in Summit County. COVID changed the way that we approached every call. You were in full PPE, trying to figure out the best way to take care of people in the back of an ambulance. You know, doing CPR in full PPE is an experience that I'm good if I never do again. So going into a new experience without knowing anybody can be a little bit overwhelming at first, but to feel other people like can truly not only empathize, but sympathize with you. It's a very, I guess, welcoming feeling. All of these folks are, they're burned out. They've been working crazy hours under crazy conditions for the last 18 months. And I think the idea of recharging is very appealing. A lot of folks just want to get away from the, the chaos that is their lives. But I also think deep, more deeply than that is a chance to use adventure to, to like I said, find their, their sense of self, to, to, to regain their confidence or regain their, their spirit. I think it's compelling. I need a helmet. Yeah. Doing something you've never done before is intimidating to begin with, and then something that requires so much physicality in a way that is different than a lot of other activities I've ever tried, but then realizing it's a mental game. That's all it is. <laughs> it's a nice visual. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it increased my anxiety level like tenfold. I was like, I can't do this. But you just have to realize that your brain is trying to keep you alive and push through it. Of the rope. And what we always want is a tail that's at least, oh, six inches or so in height. Today was interesting. I told some of the other healthcare workers on our way that I can be a lot of talk initially. So when I get up there, you know, I, I do sometimes need support. And while this was extremely terrifying and completely out of my comfort zone, it was also this amazing, empowering experience once you got to the top. Yes. It's not just stepping up on a rock and, you know, kind of climbing thing. It's it's figuring out where to put your feet and how to balance, you know, weight. And I mean, it's just a lot of things running through your head. Good. This experience, you know, I think all of us initially came in thinking we're going to learn how to rock climb and it's going to be awesome. And it has been. But more so, I'm just extremely excited to go home with all these bonds and refilling my cup so that I can go in and again take care of my people and my community. I want to give a shout out just to everybody and it was just felt great to be in such a supportive 
and positive environment. Like, you looked like you were having fun even if you were frustrated. <laughs> she just twirled and then <laughs> was shimmied right back up <laughs> there. And it was the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> 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 she goes, Skid Mark, could you uh, blow up your tutu for me? <laughs> <laughs> Being a healthcare worker under normal conditions is challenging. Every day you go to work and people's lives literally hang in the balance. And I think when COVID hit, it amplified that. And it's really by bringing folks with a similar background into this experience that we can really help them grow, feel like they're not alone, and, and really just come out the other side with, with a new sense of, of, of purpose. We've been through so many struggles, so many challenges and we haven't even had a moment to take a breath throughout this. And this really highlighted our mental capacity, our mental strength, as well as what we can overcome each day. This experience has brought me a lot of personal growth. This experience has been, I guess, transcendent. Hard and fun and therapeutic. Soul recharging. Personal expansion. Wonderful camaraderie. 100% positive environment. I'm very grateful for everybody else, so that's all I want to say. I'm sure my neighbors sit there and wonder, you know, why I sit out here holding a black sock in the air. The COVID pandemic has been very, very personal to me. Um, my colleagues and I, um, and particularly my nursing colleagues, have been uh, right up in it uh, from the get-go. So it's been a very high-stress time um, taking care of patients with COVID. You know, it, it is admittedly a little odd. I'm what's called a hospitalist. So I take care of adults who are too sick to go home from the emergency department. When you think about the beauty of what nature has in store, that all this is molecules of water crystallizing at 107.9 degree angles. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Colorado Hospital. You know, one of the things that we talk about in the medical profession is resilience. And um, resilience is really hard to maintain when you think about, you know, for two years, everyone's holding their breath, waiting for something to end. And the thing is, you got to breathe. You gotta find a way to take a breath and enjoy life. I have to catch the flakes right before they fall because you, you can't pick them up once they hit the ground. So notice I'm not holding the sock like this, I'm holding it like vertically because the snowflakes that are fun to photograph actually will cling as they fall down the side of the, the, uh, the uh, sock. I am an official snowflakeologist. <laughs> A lot of people ask, you know, is it really true that there are no two snowflakes alike? And that's true. If you look at snowflakes really closely, you'll see that they're almost never symmetric up close. Just the span of one tiny snowflake encounters different microclimates, which change how it crystallizes. So it, it, it's remarkable. Some of the snowflakes are just so stunningly beautiful. And to realize that here I am standing in a deck that's covered in trillions of them, <laughs> it's just crazy. Here I am honing in on just one. Right there, there's a snowflake. Oh man, I wish I could focus up closer, but if I change the angle on it, it gets more or less reflective. Oh, I wish I could get it just right. So the key uh, to good snowflake photos, well first you have to have good snow, <laughs> and it has to be really cold, and you have to be outside. The hazard is I could squish one of the models. And I, I strictly practice catch and release, um, I, I, you know, I freshly source all my snowflakes, but I make sure that they come back to a good home. <laughs> <laughs> the other part that's really key in, in snowflake photos is the lighting. Just a hair's breadth of tilt in my camera can completely change whether you see a beautiful snowflake or you don't. Oh, it's really pretty too. You know, it's, what's fun about snowflake photography is it's something you do in the field. Um, so my studio is really complex. It's a table the sock, a light, and my camera. <laughs> That's it. But I do welcome all snowflakes of all different shapes and sizes to come visit, and I'm always happy when they do. But some of those centers are incredible. They look like etched glass. So I find a lot of solace, uh, first and foremost, in my family, who are kind of hysterical. Um, they're, they're a great support system. 
but I also find it in photography. Oh yeah. Oh, this one's this one's got color in it. It sounds crazy that you know snowflakes of all things could be very therapeutic, but it's an opportunity to bond with my creator and also to see the world in a way that um, few people take the time to notice. So snowflakes can do. Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, it's got some broken arms, but it, it can be salvaged. But I'll show you this. This is pretty crazy. So you wouldn't think that snow has color to it. Um, you just think it's it is white. But it turns out that as the snowflake forms, it can create a layer that is, is two different densities in the center. And that acts a lot like gasoline on water and will refract those colors. These are leftover bits of dust in the atmosphere. But it's very, very difficult to explain how much beauty is on each of these snowflakes. So I feel like many other people feel also, right, these last two years have felt like a time warp, right? They are so insanely slow, but then you look back and you're like, what have we just lived through? And I can say based on, you know, being in New York City and in April of 2020 and knowing nothing about the patients that we were caring for and literally trying anything and everything under the sun, you know, fast forward for two years later, and like we have effective treatments, we have effective ways to prevent you from getting really sick. I hope that that brings people a little bit of sense of security. So if somebody is watching this video, um, I would wanna say number one would be like, please be kind to us <laughs> and remember like, we're here to help you at the end of the day, no matter what. And then I think number two would be like, even though things seem dark at times, like there is so much more to be hopeful for and to feel less anxious about and to be less scared of. So if you do get Omicron, what can you do? Well, first thing is open all your windows because we know that COVID is a virus and the viral load actually matters. So, And I think that's the, the number one thing I try to keep getting across on social media is it's not over. We're going to have ups and downs and we can predict them and we may not be able to predict them. But at the end of the day, at least your healthcare professionals have some idea of what they're doing. So hopefully that makes you feel better. <laughs> makes me feel better. <laughs>